Coming up, this agility champ has speed, but can he stay in control? Bringing an autistic child out of his shell. And detecting termites before they cause damage. The city of Saragossa in northeast Spain was founded 2,000 years ago. The popular sport of dog agility is relatively new to Spain. Elite is one of its bright lights. He's won 15 competitions and was one of only four Spanish dogs to qualify for the 2000 World Championships in Helsinki. Tomorrow, Elite has a big competition in Barcelona. Our main goal right now is to make the Spanish team again. This coming year, the championships will be held in Germany, and I think we have a good chance. But there's a problem. Elite's owner, David Molina, sometimes loses control. Elite speeds ahead on his own and makes mistakes. At last year's championships in Helsinki, it got them disqualified. I didn't do as well as I could have, so that's a bit of a thorn in my side. I'd like to get rid of this thorn because the dog is now at an ideal age. He's six years old now and he's in top shape. He has great potential to qualify. In agility competitions, handlers direct their dogs through a challenging obstacle course in a race against the clock. To excel, dogs need the right combination of speed and technique. They also need to understand precisely what their handlers are asking them to do. I normally indicate the tunnel to him by lowering my hand. When it's time to weave through the poles, I signal with my hand up. I always try to reinforce the voice commands with some physical gesture, so it makes it harder for him to make a mistake because he can hear me as well as see me. There will be close to 100 dogs at tomorrow's competition, but David is feeling confident. It's an important competition, and we've been working hard. I think it should go well. The dog is in good shape. We hope to do well. Elite and his son Leo are both purebred Spanish water dogs. I could have chosen any other good agility breed, like the Border Collie, but I saw that Spanish water dogs had the qualities I could work with. Spanish water dogs are very agile, versatile, and they're dogs who love to work. They're also very playful, so they seemed ideal for agility. I also like the fact it was a Spanish breed. Elite wasn't always friendly and outgoing. He'd been abused by his previous owner. I saw that this dog had incredible energy, but he was too wild. He needed to be worked on. He needed a lot of love. It didn't seem like he'd had a very good life. He was aggressive with other dogs and with people. I didn't really know anything about dogs when I got him. I was 21 or 22. I was a bit wild too. Elite was just as good therapy for me as I was for him. So we've been quite close since I got him. And agility has really helped both of us, to the point where he's probably one of the best dogs in Spain. The love and attention David lavished on Elite has transformed both of them. David is now a family man, and Elite the family pet. For now, they're relaxed, but tomorrow's competition isn't far from their minds. Things are getting underway at the competition. Dogs have come from all over Spain. There are two rounds. 
Elite is number 26, so he and David have a two-hour wait for their turn. David likes to keep his distance from the competition. Half an hour before going on the obstacle course, I play with him. I get him excited, so he knows he has to go out excited. Then I let him rest for five minutes before going on the obstacle course. I show him his reward, his ball. I'll give it to him at the end of the obstacle course. He knows he has to earn it, so he'll go all the way. It's finally Elite's turn. David loses control of Elite, and the dog jumps over the hurdle from the wrong side. I made a mistake. I called him in too early. I lost sight of the next obstacle, and the dog went off too fast. I lost him. Jumping from the wrong side got us eliminated. The dog was doing well, he was happy. A little slow for Elite, but it was my fault. It was my fault. Elite and David are disqualified from round one, but there's still the second round to come. It's sad, but that's the way it is. I'll do the last round and do it well and give the dog more experience. It's by making mistakes that you learn. Elite's second round is about to start. Elite has the fastest time for round two. Unfortunately, their disqualification earlier means they won't make the podium. I always say that everything we've achieved together and everything that we will achieve together is important. But above all, Elite is my best friend. That's really clear to me. I often talk with him as I would with any friend. I tell him my personal stuff. And I often go for walks with him to relax. Actually, it's a relationship. He's been a very special being in my life. He's been much more than competitions, prizes, and all those other things we do. Much more than all that. Ottawa, the capital of Canada, home to Valen, a Nova Scotia duck tolling retriever. On the lawns of Ottawa University, he and his owner, Marielle and Boyer, are getting ready to work. Oh, boy, Valen, who's that? Yeah. Oh, boy. Say hi. How are you doing? Hi, Sarah. Hello. Come on. Come on, Sarah. Yeah. It's Valen's second session with Kevin, an autistic eight-year-old. 
Valen's job is to help Kevin work on communication and motor skills. Two more. Two more. What's that? Three times. Two. Another time. Three. Good. Now, how do you tell Valen, let's go? Oh, that's mine. How do we say Valen, let's go? How do we say Valen? Walk. Say Valen, walk. Valen, up. <laughs> Kevin's disability is really hard to define. Um, he's, as far as we can tell, has a mixture of, of autism and cerebral palsy. He has very poor motor control and um, has very few verbal skills. He communicates mostly using hand gestures and signs um, and is making a, a big effort right now to learn to communicate. Good boy, you're a pro. I swear, just one week. Right now, Kevin's learning to walk with Valen by holding onto his harness. We're also working on basic commands, both with the dog and the child, um, to get them to stop and, uh, and wait. Over here. Over here. So we can see. Yeah, so we can see. And say, Valen, Valen, down. Oh, yeah. Down. Good for you. Good boy. Oh, softly. And now we got to pat the dog. Come and pet Valen. Come and pet Valen. You got to come pet Balin first. One. Actually, just learning to pet the dog gently um, with his hand, with a flat, open hand. And it's, it's the conditional reward system. In order to work with the dog, he has to pet the dog three times softly before we can continue. And so that's where we're at right now. And, and a couple from Sarah. Oh, can you count up to three? <laughs> Good stuff, Sarah. We are working with the entire Sharma family right now because it's working with a child like Kevin, you can't take them out of their family context. The family is part of everyday life and the family needs to learn to work with the dog and with the new skills as well. It's a package deal. Um, so mom and dad are perfect motivators for targets to walk to. We also work with Kevin's older sister, Sarah, who as a sibling has found herself missing out on a bit of the attention because of the amount of time her brother requires and Basically, we're teaching Sarah to be the dog handler in the family. So she now has an extra responsibility that makes her very proud, which is to handle the family dog so that she can enjoy time with her brother. And it, it makes her part of the entire therapy process. It's a very stressful job in that it requires attention all of the time because of the nature of the work we do. Our kids just don't realize what danger is most of the time. So I need to have a dog that that's able to rely on his inst instincts of what's dangerous and get a child out of a dangerous situation. Give a kiss. Give a kiss. Yeah, very good. Valen is Marie-Hélène's walking, breathing laboratory. She's writing a master's thesis on the bonds that develop between children with disabilities and the dogs that help them. Well, my main area of interest happens to be working with children with disabilities in varying degrees of disabilities and in understanding the bond that builds between a working animal and a child and the whole process of getting a child out of his or her little world and bringing them out further into ours. Usually the dog acts like a bridge and it's just the wonderful gap filler for the job. Do they keep the same dog throughout their, its working life or do they change the dog when the child's needs change? Well, Valen is in a multi-assignment service dog program, so the dog works with multiple kids. Um, we'll work with children until they're either ready and incapable of having a service dog of their own. Uh, we also help them train the family pet so that the family dog can become a bit of an assistance as well. Valen works about 20 to 25 hours a week and that's very intensive work of high energy, high input work. He works on a daily basis almost seven days a week and he's on call 24 hours a day when we have specific surgical needs so a child that's undergoing surgery and is having some major emotional crisis over it we're on call we go slowly slowly after only two months of weekly sessions Valen's work with Kevin has made a remarkable difference. What we were very surprised to see is how quickly he's adapted to, uh, to seeing him and, and right away going into some of the instructions that we do with him. So very surprised. He's very highly motivated to work with Valen, holding onto the handle, which is very important. He's following the instructions and he's going through the routines that we would like him to see. 
towards the street. We're gonna cross this street. Kevin gonna cross the street? Yeah, good boy. Come on. Well, what we've seen uh, with, uh, with mm -hmm. Kevin and Balin is, uh, is a much better interaction. Kevin's walking is much better. It's much more controlled, which is uh, one of the objectives. And then at home with our own dog, what we've seen with uh, Kevin and Gus is a better interaction. And uh, Kevin is taking Gus's lead and he's walking him and he's uh, giving him uh, commands to sit. So that's something that we haven't seen before and that's what we think we attribute to the way that Valen and Kevin have been working together. So that's what we're finding at home now. Kevin's also made progress going up and down stairs safely. Stop, all the way down. One more. One and more. yay! <laughs> Once we get home, Valen usually runs into the house and greets Sophie, the family golden retriever, and then normally runs for a drink, and really quickly thereafter, he um, curls up either by the side of the piano when I'm practicing and um, otherwise just tries to recuperate from the big day and the big days that he, he spends out working. So it's his, his home downtime and his relaxing time where he gets just to be a dog. Ah, Florida, the Sunshine State. Unfortunately for residents, it's also the termite capital of the world. Each year, these tiny insects with humongous appetites cause billions of dollars of property damage. By the time signs are visible to the human eye, it's often too late. That's why people call on Tracker. Man's best friend is a termite's worst enemy. This beagle is the nose behind Royal Termite and Pest Control. His owners, Sharon and Paul Roberts, look after the business end of things. In Florida, there's two types of homes. There's those that have termites and those that will have termites. Tracker gets an average of four calls a day. This building is called the Palace. It's a building that Tracker found tons of termites in and is now in the process of being fully restored. Sharon bought Tracker from Bill Wittstein, who rescued Tracker from the pound and trained him for his own termite problem. Tracker's the most happy dog in the world to see Bill. Tracker loves Bill more than anything in the world, and he just loves being with him and playing and hugging and all the good stuff. When we first got Tracker, he was a troublemaker. He was a typical beagle. He liked to run away, he barked a lot, he dug holes. So we had to go through some obedience with him, but he had a strong desire uh, to please, and that's what's important. Uh, you know, he was, he was put, brought to the pound because he was, a, he was quote unquote a bad dog, but they, they misjudged him. When we look for a dog that is willing to please, what we mean by that is we look for a dog that is willing to uh, do what we ask. If we ask him to sniff a wall or go get a ball or, or to play frisbee or play catch, they want to please. They, they have the desire to do what you want them to do. And they, they just, it's fun for them. See, see, good boy, see. Good see, good boy. What we do is we build walls and simulate uh, by building them out of drywall and wood, and we hide the termites in there. And when we hide them in there, we have about 10 or 15 termites in there, and we're able to simulate uh, by hiding them in those simulated walls. And we know in a home that you're gonna have 10 or 20,000 termites in your walls, so it's much easier actually in the real world than training. Good boy. Ready? See, see. Seek, seek, seek. Humans can detect boy. scent in a few parts per hundred. Tracker can detect scent in a few parts per trillion. That's like a few drops of rain on a football field. Show me, show me, show me, show me. If Tracker can Good find boy, five Tracker. termites in a can, finding thousands chomping away in a fire station will be a cinch. The firefighters have left and set up temporary quarters across town while Tracker searches the station. It'll take him about an hour seek. to cover 2,000 square feet. Seek, 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 let's work, let's work, come on. Seek, 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 good boy, seek, seek, seek. 
Tracker and Sharon go around the perimeter of the room to see if Tracker can pick up a termite odor. Once he alerts, Sharon and Paul can investigate the damage further. Good boy, good boy, good boy, Tracker, good boy. After Tracker pinpoints the location of the termites, Paul uses a boroscope to determine the extent of the damage in the wall. We do have a boroscope where we can draw a quarter inch hole into the wall, insert the boroscope, and actually film what we see inside the wall. Good boy, seek, tracker, seek, seek. All right, show me, show me, show me. Good boy, tracker, good boy, good boy. When tracker boy. sniffs out termites, he's rewarded good with food and plenty of affection. Good boy. Tracker comes along and may alert in an area that we haven't seen damage yet, but yet they're already in the walls or underneath the house eating wood seek, and destroying seek, the home. Seek, 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 seek. Show me, show me. Good boy, Tracker man, good boy. Seek, Tracker's seek, skill seek, is in early seek, detection. Show me. Even show if there me. are termites in show the me. ceiling, good he can boy, detect Tracker them man. from the bottom good of the wall. Boy. Good boy, Tracker Man. As a fireman, we're on call 24 hours, and living here in the station, we didn't realize there were so many termites. And seeing Tracker, the dog, come in and go straight to the lockers, find the termites in the wall, it was really amazing. And as you see now, they're tending the station to get rid of the problem. Once Tracker detects termites, the building is fumigated. To hold the gas in, it's tented using large tarps. Three months from now, Tracker will be back to do a checkup. At home, Tracker has to share Sharon and Paul's affections with Hunter, TJ, and Chewy. Okay, two dogs. That's a good girl. Chewy, Chewy, Chewy. It's like having triplets. It's just full triplets, except that they're beagles, and they run around constantly, and they're never still, and you're always watching them. You have to uh, make sure they're not going to tear something up or, or get a little too rough with each other. So it's kind of like, I think, having triplets.